there is perhaps no one better qualified to tell us about another renowned figure whose work bridges the art science divide than tonight's speaker, Mr. Robert Peck from the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University in Philadelphia. I have followed and admired Bob's work for many years. Among other things, he's published many books at the intersection of art and science and especially natural history, including natural history museums. And if you've never read any of Bob, any of those books, I would encourage you to do so. You will not be disappointed. Bob received his bachelor's degree in art and archeology span from Princeton and a master's in American cultural history from the University of Delaware. He's held a variety of positions at the Academy during his tenure there. He's currently senior fellow and curator of art and artifacts. Over his career, he's authored or co-authored seven books and published articles in magazines and journals as diverse as Natural History, Antiques, and The Explorer's Journal. His most recent book, Specimens of Hair, The Curious Collection of Peter A. Brown, was selected by Publishers Weekly as a recommended purchase for last Christmas <laughs> under a category the magazine called Slightly Weird and Very Wonderful. <laughs> I have read the book. It is more than slightly weird, but it is very wonderful. <laughs> Along the way, he's picked up numerous honors and awards, including an honorary doctorate in humane letters from the University of Delaware, a second honorary doctorate from the Wagner Free Institute of Science of Philadelphia, the Explorers Club Award for Courage and Integrity, the Garden Club of America Sarah Chapman Francis Medal for Writing, and the Wick Strickland Award for Contributions to the Cultural Life of Philadelphia. I first met Bob in person a few years ago when we were both invited speakers at the annual symposium of the Preservation Society of Newport County in Newport, Rhode Island. The topic of that year's symposium was Inspired by the Sea, the Material Culture of Newport and Other Ports of Call. And Bob and I were lumped together in the same session because, as far as I could tell, the organizers didn't know what to make of either of us and figured that we'd do less harm if we were deployed together in the same session. <laughs> this symposium is a good gig. Each day the sessions convene in one or another of Newport's great mansions, and speakers are hosted in grand fashion. So Bob, I'd like you to try to envision that you're not speaking in the dismal geological lecture hall at Harvard University with its creaky, uncomfortable seats and primitive uh, climate control, but instead you're in the breakers with gilded chandeliers above and oriental carpets below. Robert Peck, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, I think this is every bit as good as the breakers. And I'm delighted to be here, uh, very honored by the invitation from Harvard to speak to you tonight, and so happy to see so many of you with us. I mean, I. I know there are a few of you who are here as friends of mine, just to be nice. But most of you are here probably because, like me, you grew up loving Edward Lear. Uh, your parents may have read Lear's nonsense to you as a child, or perhaps you discovered Lear on your own and then uh, had the fun of reading it to your children or grandchildren. My wife and I have three children at home, one of whom is in college, and two of whom will be headed to college, we hope, next year. Uh, so they're, they're a little bit older uh, for, for Lear's writing, but when they were six or seven, five or six, they used to love, particularly the boys, would ask every night when I was putting them to bed if I would read from Lear's nonsense writing. Uh, and they, they absolutely loved it, as did I, the, the fun of, of talking to, to them about Lear. Um, they referred to his book as the nosy book because there were so many people with noses in it. I think I might have referred to it as the birdie book, because there are so many birds in so many of the things he drew. Uh, it's a subject I'll tell you a little bit more about later. Um, but in many of his cartoons and his famous alphabets, he drew lots of other animals as well, from bears and owls to monkeys riding on zebras' backs, <laughs> 
and elsewhere from storks, frogs, and guinea pigs to turtles, owls, and cats, and even kangaroos. And of course, he drew lots of cartoons of people, including this one, which I think he intended to represent himself, surrounded by his beloved birds and reading a book of his own nonsense in a frock coat a generation or more out of fashion. And I love the way he's got the feet turned around backwards. It's a, it's a very Lyrian touch. His limericks have earned him a worldwide following of people of all ages and a place at Poets' Corner in Westminster Abbey immediately next to Lewis Carroll's, the other great 19th century nonsense poet with whom he's often compared, but strangely never had a chance to meet. They had a number of mutual friends, but their paths seem to have, have always gone in slightly different directions. In 1988, to commemorate the bicentennial of Edward Lear's death, the British Postal Service issued four stamps celebrating Lear's unmatched wit and artistic flair. These included a self-caricature of the bearded artist flying on improbably small wings, a sketch of the two protagonists from The Owl and the Pussycat, his most famous poem, a drawing of Lear's beloved stub-tailed cat, Foss, and a limerick illustration of a bonneted lady on whose hat a flock of imaginary birds is attempting to roost. The affable Lear would have been astonished and no doubt pleased by his country's philatelic attention, but almost certainly disappointed by the choice of images with which the Royal Mail chose to celebrate the centennial of his death. He considered the illustrated limericks and other nonsense verse only an incidental sideline to his more serious focus on natural history and landscape painting. In fact, the artist so feared that his nonsensical flights of fancy, that is his nonsense poetry, would undermine his reputation in the scientific world, he refused to have his name associated with their publication until decades after they had won for him a devoted following around the world. We tend to think of Edward Lear as a jolly, round Victorian with a wonderful sense of humor a man who made children laugh by gently poking fun at the improbable foibles of eccentric adults not unlike himself. All of this is certainly one part of Edward Lear. But the Lear I want to tell you about this evening is a younger, lighter, slightly more serious man, an artist who dazzled the scientific world with paintings of birds the likes of which no one had seen before. It's a wonderful story of a modest, self-deprecating, <coughs> self-taught talent reshaping the worlds of art and science while winning a place in the hearts of generations of children he never knew. It's the story of a man whose life was perfectly timed to coincide with those interesting years of the British Empire in which naturalists in the newly settled colonies of Australia, India, Africa, and elsewhere were collecting and sending to London an astonishing array of new birds and mammals, reptiles, amphibians, insects, and plants. These, in turn, fostered an appetite for books about them among the aristocracy and the rising middle class. My love of Lear as a natural history painter grew directly from his pictures, but my impetus for writing a book about it came from my longtime friend and mentor, Sir David Attenborough who first proposed the idea to me more than 25 years ago. I've written and published a number of other books, but his encouragement through the years has kept bringing me back to Lear and to his remarkable achievements. Sir David's friendly proddings and a very nice invitation from David Godine in 2012 ultimately resulted in the book that was published in 2016. A Chinese edition was published just last year the book is divided into two sections. The first and largest part is on Lear himself and his interest in natural history. The second part is about Lear's influence on other artists over time. And I'll present tonight's lecture in pretty much that same order, devoting about two thirds or three quarters of my talk to Lear and showing as many images of him and by him as I possibly can, 
And then I'll close with a few of the artists who are carrying on his traditions today. To put all of what I'll say tonight in context, I'd like to begin with Lear's remarkable family history. He was the 20th of 21 children, <laughs> born in 1812 to a middle-class family in a village suburb north of London. And I should say, they were all by the same father and, and mother, the all 21 children. Poor Mrs. Lear. <laughs> a reversal of family fortune when he was just four years old caused the family to be dispersed. And Lear was raised by his oldest sister, Anne, 21 years his senior. It was Lear's artistic talent and appealing personality, rather than his family connections, that would ultimately take him from a modest upbringing in North London to Osborne House on the Island of Wight and Buckingham Palace, where in 1846, he served as the drawing instructor to Queen Victoria. He produced several books on his travels in Italy and elsewhere and ended his days on the Italian Riviera after traveling the world with pencil and brush in hand. But I'm getting ahead of myself and ahead of Lear's amazing life story. Let me return to the very beginning of Lear's artistic career. While not a great deal survives from this period, the Houghton Library here at Harvard is fortunate to have several albums created between 1827 and 1830 when Lear was just 15 or 16 years old. At least two of the albums were evidently created by Anne Lear, who was a talented artist in her own right and with the help of Edward, who was under her tutelage, then just learning the rudiments of drawings, they put together these albums. So similar in style are many of the pictures in the albums that were some of them not signed, it would be impossible to say who painted which. The pheasants on the left are clearly signed by Anne, and you may, you may not be able to see it where you're sitting, but there is a, a signature in the lower right. The birds on the right could be by either Anne or Edward, though I suspect the latter, for there are many others that are very similar to it, which do bear his distinctive signature. One thing you'll notice in all of these early works is that both the botanical illustrations and the birds tend to be very colorful and somewhat imaginary. It's possible that this early work by the Lear siblings was inspired by the so-called fancy bird porcelain ceramics that were then being made in England and Germany. It's also possible that Lear and his older sister were hoping to sell their designs to one of the English manufacturers of the day, and perhaps they did. This is something that still needs more research. At about the same time he was making his fanciful paintings of birds, Lear was also making very accurate studies of plants. And this was under the influence of another sister named Sarah. Also, as revealed in his albums, he was beginning to make some bird paintings that were based more on living birds than on his imagination. In this red and yellow macaw, for example, we see the childlike treatment of landscape coupled with a very original and realistic pose and attitude of the bird itself. This is almost certainly a bird painted from life by a teenaged Edward Lear, whose ability to capture the vitality of his subjects would only improve with time. Elsewhere in the albums are images that move dramatically from the imaginary world of his childhood to the very real world of the London Zoo, which opened to the public just as Lear was growing interested in natural history. This page in one of Lear's youthful albums at Houghton makes it very clear that Lear was getting his inspiration from living birds. Four of the five feathers here are real parrot feathers glued onto the page. One, however, the most delicate one, is a watercolor, probably a wing feather from a European jay. And I think these feathers probably looked much better when they were first pasted in. They've gotten a little ruffled over time. Uh, but I imagine there was a time when you really couldn't tell which was the real feather and which was his painting. And so we see here in these three pages, all from the same album, the coming of age of Edward Lear as a natural history painter, who could combine accurate depictions of the birds he saw with an irreverent, joyful attitude that infuses his subjects with life. 
Scientific illustration in the 18th and 19th century tended to be still and lifeless, even when the subjects were alive, as in these birds by Eliezer Alban. Specimens were generally shown in profile against white backgrounds. Trees and branches were sometimes used as necessary devices to support specimens, most of which were drawn from skins rather than from living birds. The same was true with books of mammals. Edward Lear and his American contemporary John James Audubon were about to change that. Compare, for example, these stiff, lifeless mammals from Edward Godman's American Natural History, published in 1826, with these life studies of mammals by Edward Lear, painted only a few years later. Or these bird plates by Alexander Wilson, American Ornithology, with these watercolors by Edward Lear. And I'll say more about uh, the style of Lear's painting shortly, but for the moment, let me continue the story of Lear's emergence as an artist. While he was still in his teens, he made small amounts of money drawing what he described as, quote, uncommon queer shop sketches and, quote, making morbid disease drawings for hospitals and certain doctors of physic. Unfortunately, none of these anatomical drawings has survived, or at least they haven't been identified as being drawn by Lear. They may be unsigned and circulating out there. But they were probably like the ones you see here, hanging on the walls of this inst instructional anatomy classroom in London. Because his medical illustrations were so grim, we can well imagine Lear's delight when he was asked to create some illustrations for William Bennett, a founder and longtime officer of the Zoological Society of London. Bennett asked him to supply a number of vignettes to enliven a two-volume work on the animals at the zoo that he was then writing. Strangely, and unfortunately for Lear, his work was not acknowledged in the book. We know of his contributions only because he inserted his subtle but distinctive EL monogram in the backgrounds of two of the illustrations, the white-fronted lemurs and the blue and yellow macaws. And you can see it here, it's an EL. It looks very much like the British pound sign, which may have also been a sort of a pun that Lear was playing on his readers for the, either the amount of money he'd been paid, which would have been very small, or perhaps he was paid nothing at all. Uh, so he, he got a, a, a little laugh by putting in the, the pound. Though no doubt pleased to be published at all, Lear was determined not to remain anonymous for long. Sometime in 1827 or 28, possibly before the Zoological Society even opened to the doors to the public, Lear conceived of and began working on a portfolio of drawings of birds and animals in the zoological gardens that he intended to market as individual lithographs and sold as sets with the idea that they could either be enjoyed as prints or could be bound together and retained in book form. For a 16 or 17 year old artist with no experience in publishing and no independent resources to back his venture, this was a remarkably ambitious undertaking. It's significant because it is unquestionably Lear's first self-publishing effort Though un unmentioned by Lear himself or Lear scholars until now, the project has just enough surviving remnants on both sides of the Atlantic to confirm its existence and to raise questions as to why it was attempted and why it failed. A single surviving lithographic wrapper for the first part of Lear's book, a detail of which I'm showing here, is owned by the Zoological Society in London while an original wash study for the Peaceable Kingdom vignette is contained in one of the youthful albums here at Houghton. Also contained in that same album is a pencil sketch of a polar bear that was to have been one of the plates in Lear's planned portfolio. This is the sketch, and this is the only surviving example of the lithograph Lear made of it, with the sketch inserted in the left for, just for comparison. The only other plates that are known to survive from this early work are the head of a sleeping lion, which I find very appealing, and a view of a harpy eagle. 
Whether Lear lost interest in the project or found it too difficult to fund, we do not know. But in any case, he appears to have abandoned the venture by the end of 1829. Perhaps he had already shifted his focus away from an amorphous audience of general zoo visitors. It seems he may have chosen to focus instead on a more committed and better funded audience. The new patrons he had, had identified were a small group of collectors who were interested in acquiring and raising the colorful members of the parrot family as pets and as status symbols. These exotic birds, always popular with the aristocracy, were in the 1820s and 30s arriving in London from Australia, Africa, and South America in increasing numbers. They were being acquired at a considerable expense, not just by the zoo, but by private collectors for inclusion in the aviaries found on some of the great country estates throughout the British Isles. Lear was fascinated by these birds and saw in their owners a possible audience for his artistic talent. In 1830, at the age of 18, Lear requested permission from the Council of the Zoological Society to have access to their parrots for the purpose of creating a book on the subject. Permission was granted, and for the next two years, Lear spent much of his time drawing these colorful creatures from life. We are fortunate that at least 30 of Lear's working drawings and paintings for this great parrot monograph still survive. Most of them are here at Harvard. They impart a sense of excitement and spontaneity that is almost without precedent in the history of scientific illustration. Even Audubon's studies from this period, most of which were made from dead specimens, failed to capture the sense of vitality that can be seen in many of Lear's studies. I mention Audubon here not just because his name is so much better as a, known as a bird painter here in the United States, but because he is one of the very few other artists of the period who had comparable ability. Although Lear was a full generation younger than Audubon, the two began work on their respective books in London in the very same year, 1827. Unlike Lear, Audubon's production was something of a team effort. He generally limited his own paintings to the birds and had assistants paint the backgrounds and floral details. He also had the help of Robert Havell Jr., arguably the best engraver of the 19th century, who took Audubon's paintings and turned them into the magnificent hand-colored double elephant folio aquatint prints that we so admire today. By contrast, Lear did everything himself, including the transfer of his watercolor studies, drawn from living birds, onto lithographic stone for printing, a process at which he was almost completely self-taught and something of a pioneer. It was undoubtedly this tremendous talent, both in painting and in printmaking, that drew the attention and admiration of John Gould. Gould, who would become one of the greatest natural history book publishers of the 19th century, was the chief taxidermist and curator at the London Zoo when Lear began working on his parrot monograph there. He was a mentor to Lear, but also something of a competitor, for he was just then beginning to launch his own career as an author and publisher of ornithological books. From the moment Lear published his spectacular book on parrots, Gould began to court him, offering to employ the financially stressed younger artist as an illustrator and an instructor to his wife, Elizabeth. This may have been an act of generosity toward Lear, but it was undoubtedly also a self-interested one, for the business-savvy Gould decided it was better to have Lear working for him than against him as a publisher of fine bird books. Like Lear, Gould's wife Elizabeth was an entirely self-taught artist, but she was far less capable than Lear. Gould had charged her with making all of the plates for his first book, and she was struggling to do so while also trying to raise a young family. Here is one of Elizabeth Gould's illustrations for John Gould's book on Himalayan birds. And here is another. And I show you this one in particular 
so that you can compare Elizabeth Gould's owl with an owl plate made at about the same time by Lear, her younger teacher. And here you can see the two illustrations side by side. I like to call it the perky owl and the droopy owl. <laughs> and I think you can tell who did which. Fortunately, the two artists got along well, and Lear was able to improve Elizabeth Gould's style in the years they worked together. This charming sketch by Lear of a pet field vole kept by Elizabeth Gould hints at the close personal relationship the two developed as they worked together under Gould's demanding supervision. Lear and John Gould had a complex relationship. According to letters written by Lear at the time, Gould was very helpful to him as he worked on his parrot monograph and on commissions for other publishers. He bought Lear's unsold inventory of the parrot book, some 50 copies or 2,100 hand-colored lithographs, and he took Lear on his first trip to Europe to visit zoos and natural history collections there sometime in the 1830s. In return, Lear made 68 magnificent plates for Gould's five-volume work, The Birds of Europe, as well as 10 of the 34 plates in Gould's monograph on toucans. In later years, Lear complained that Gould was driving and heartless, exploiting all those who worked for him, including his wife. Lear had reason to be resentful, for just as Audubon failed to credit those who worked for him, Gould sometimes denied Lear the credit that was due for his work. In this plate, which Lear made to illustrate Gould's monograph on toucans in 1834, we can clearly see Lear's signature worked into the composition. And you can see it here. Well, maybe if you're in the front row, you can see it. But take my word, it's there. So that was worked right into the composition, therefore in the print. And yet, the attribution line at the bottom of the print itself gives only John and Elizabeth Gould credit for the picture. Here is there, drawn from life, or drawn from nature by on stone by J. and E. Gould, uh, neither of whom had really anything to do with it. Gould's defenders would say that this was standard procedure for the time, as Lear was technically work for hire. Nevertheless, it must have been disheartening for Lear to see his hard work go unacknowledged, and to see Gould making a financial success when his own monograph on parrots had been an economic failure. Fortunately, Lear had made a strong enough impression through his own publication that his reputation was secure. When the British naturalist William Swainson received his subscription plate of the red and yellow macaw from Lear a few years earlier, he wrote to Lear to say that he considered the illustration, quote, equal to any figure ever painted by Barabond or Audubon for grace of design, perspective, or anatomical accuracy. This was high praise indeed for one of England's most influential ornithologists. Even the cash-strapped Audubon bought a copy of Lear's parrot monograph for himself, something he almost never did, being perpetually short of funds and highly critical of almost every other natural history painter working at the time. Lear's reputation earned him many commissions, including a large number of illustrations for the popular Naturalist's Library, in which Lear's work was engraved by William Lazars, the Scottish engraver who had done the first 10 plates for Audubon's Birds of America. Lazars, who had seen the work of many fine artists, including Audubon, once wrote to a friend, Lear's drawings are nature, all others are pottery ware. During the 1830s, Lear may have helped John and Elizabeth Gould with some of the plates for Charles Darwin's report on the zoological findings on his voyage of HMS Beagle, but evidence of this relationship is so far only circumstantial. Lear had many patrons, but by far the most important and most generous patron was Lord Stanley, the 13th Earl of Derby one of the wealthiest men in England and president of the Zoological Society at the time he first came into contact with Lear. In 
he was well aware of Lear's activities, not only through the zoo connection, but because several of his own birds were featured in Lear's parrot monograph, to which he had been an early subscriber. And you can see this is, says from a, a living bird uh, provided to me by Lord Stanley. In the summer of 1830, Lord Stanley invited Lear to travel north to Knowsley Hall, his sprawling estate near Liverpool. The Earl owned the largest private menagerie in England, with as many as 620 different bird species and more than 20,000 living and preserved animal specimens by the time it was dispersed in 1851. He wished to have Edward Lear document the rarest and most important of these specimens. Despite a warm welcome from the Earl and his extended family, Lear found life at Knowsley Hall somewhat intimidating. He reported as many as 30 servants serving at the table at every meal. But fortunately for Lear, there were also many children in the hall. When he wasn't working on his more formal portraits of birds, Lear entertained them with nonsensical poems and fun-filled alphabets. It was at Knowsley Hall that Lear's life as a children's writer and illustrator began. His whimsical drawings cut across all barriers of age and social standing, and he soon found himself treated like a member of the family, even getting rides to and from London with Lord Derby in his personal carriage, something quite unusual in England's highly stratified society of the day. As much as Lord Darby appreciated the fun and laughter Lear brought to Knowsley Hall, it was Lear's talent as a natural history artist that garnered his long-term patronage and support. Lord Darby took the scientific aspects of his collection very seriously. Birds and animals that were raised in his menagerie were carefully documented and preserved after death, both in Lear's paintings and as specimens which survive today as the core of the natural history collections at the Liverpool Museum. This night monkey, or Vito, painted by Lear at Knowsley, was eventually turned into a lithograph, and with 16 other illustrations by Lear, privately published by Lord Darby in 1846, in a book entitled Gleanings from the Menagerie and Avery at Knowsley Hall. The book was both stunningly beautiful and scientifically significant, with a text by John Edward Gray, keeper of the zoology department at the British Museum. Never sold on the open market, gleanings of, from the menagerie now ranks among the rarest and most sought after of 19th century natural history books. And interestingly, there are two copies at Houghton uh, of, of the hundred or so that were made, uh, one of which is from the Royal Library at Windsor. We're not quite sure how it ended up here, but <laughs> they do actually, I saw the one at Windsor, they, have, they must have had two. Maybe he, he, he gave the queen two and she just had an extra to spare. <laughs> As the decade of the 1830s reached the halfway point, Lear found himself overwhelmed by commissions, including some of these lovely plates of turtles for his friend Thomas Bell. I am up to my neck in hurry and work, from 5 a.m. to 7 p.m. without cessation, he wrote a friend. Despite the near universal acclaim of his illustrations, both for their accuracy and beauty, some of Lear's work was still being published without recognition. When Thomas Bell published a history of British quadrupeds in 1837, he credited two other artists and gave no credit to Lear at all, despite the fact that Lear produced seven illustrations for the book, including this wonderful hedgehog. And here you can see the plate. Fortunately, Lear's own annotated copy of the book survives here at Houghton. In it, he noted each of his contributions in pencil, documenting which of the plates he had created. And it may be hard for you to read these here, but, but they're little uh, inscriptions at the bottom of each, uh, drawn by me, Edward Lear. Uh, just so there'd be no confusion. <laughs> for the most part, however, Lear was given credit for his paintings. However, in a case classic example of being careful what you wish for, Lear was becoming overwhelmed 
and exhausted by the exacting work he was being asked to do. He often complained to, of his poor health and failing eyesight. Nothing smaller than an ostrich shall I soon be able to see, he complained to John Gould in 1835. From the time of his first arrival at Knowsley Hall, he found that he enjoyed drawing and painting landscapes more than the birds and animals his patron expected. A sketching trip to England's Lake District in 1835 and to Ireland the following year would ultimately convince him that this was the direction he wanted to pursue. Before abandoning his wildlife subjects, however, he came up with an audacious plan in which he could combine his interests in travel and exotic landscape with his patron's love of natural history. Sometime in 1835, when Lear was at the height of his career as a natural history illustrator, he asked Lord Darby if he would approach John James Audubon on his behalf to see if Lear might be able to accompany Audubon on one of his collecting and drawing trips to North America. A more unlikely set of traveling companions one could hardly imagine. <laughs> Audubon, the heavy drinking, swashbuckling, womanizing, bigger than life French American with an ego the size of all outdoors versus the sickly, nearsighted, slightly effeminate, very gentle Englishman with a self-deprecating humor that seemed to shield a trunkload of insecurities. Audubon tactfully diffused the idea by pointing out how difficult his upcoming trip was going to be. Lear accepted the rebuff graciously, and neither of the men ever mentioned it again. Still, I've often wondered what such a trip might have been like. With two of the greatest geniuses of wildlife painting ever to live, traveling and working together, who knows what might have emerged. In the years to follow, the two artists went their separate ways. Audubon went on to paint more wildlife subjects in his beloved America, where he could still experience and celebrate wilderness. While Lear pursued his dream of becoming a traveler and painter of landscapes in Europe, the Middle East, and Asia, where he reveled in the breadth and depth of human civilization. Because Audubon stuck to one general subject area throughout his life, he will always be remembered for his natural history paintings, and particularly his birds. Lear's reputation, by contrast, was diffused because of his eclectic interests. His charming and timeless nonsense verse and drawings endured, even as his wildlife paintings were forgotten and his landscapes fell in and out of style. Even though he never focused on natural history professionally after 1837, it still interested him. And you can find hints of his continuing love of the subject in his later work. Take this view of elephants bathing from India, painted in 1873, or this large oil of the Temple of Apollo, which he painted 20 years earlier. And it's now at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. Easily overseen at first, creeping through the foreground, is a detailed painting, just there, of a Herman's tortoise, which gives scientific accuracy to the painting, but also may have been Lear's subtle and humorous attempt at a self-portrait, as if showing himself wandering through the ancient ruins of Greece at a tortoise's pace. From 1837 on, Lear was a voracious traveler, covering vast territory during his long life, often sp spending time in off-the-beaten-path sorts of places. And I drew this map, actually, with all of the arrows emanating from London, uh, only because, he, he, although he was living in Italy for much of this time, uh, he was in different places, and, and the arrows became very confusing when I <laughs> drew them from where he was at any given time. But he did go back to London every year both to see members of his family, which as you remember was quite large, uh, and also to try to sell paintings. He would have small exhibits, he had dealers in London, and he had patrons there uh, who he wanted to support. So, so I made all the arrows go from London, but though that gives you some idea of, of the amazing amount of traveling he did. Uh, 
that this map doesn't even show his travels up the Nile and in Ceylon and India, where he reveled in the palms and other plant life he saw. When I go to heaven, if indeed I go, he wrote in 1862, and I'm surrounded by thousands of polite angels, I shall say courteously, please leave me alone. Let me have a park and a beautiful view of sea and hill, mountain and river, valley and plain, with no end of tropical foliage. These quick washes, painted in India toward the end of his life, are, I think, among his most appealing botanical works. By the time of his death in San Remo, Italy, in 1888, he had created almost 400 natural history paintings. More than 7,000 watercolors documenting his travels in Europe, the Mediterranean, and the Middle East, and India, about 2,000 studio watercolors, and more than 300 oil paintings, many of them quite large. He published five illustrated travel books, his monograph on parrots, and more than 200 other lithographs of birds, mammals, and reptiles from various parts of the world for other authors. Imitation, it's said, is the sincerest form of flattery. But I would suggest that inspiration might be an equally valid way of charting the influence of an artist. Lear has been inspiring imitators and kindred spirits for almost 200 years. And in the last few minutes that I have with you this evening, I want to show you the work of a handful of contemporary artists who continue to be inspired by him today. As you might imagine, there are many artists who have created illustrations to accompany Lear's verses. I show here, as an example, a collection of Lear's favorite limericks as reinterpreted by the Canadian artist Michel Lemieux. This interesting version of The Owl and the Pussycat is by the noted children's book illustrator Jan Brett, who has given the subject a Caribbean theme. It's an original conception that uses the words and captures the spirit of Edward Lear while departing considerably from his much more Spartan, linear style. Looking through the long history of artists inspired by Lear, we find a who's who of children's book illustrators, from Beatrix Potter, who incorporated his stories into many of her illuminated letters to children, to Maurice Sendak, who loved Lear's stories so much that he drew one of his own characters from Where the Wild Things Are, reading a copy of one of Lear's books. Other favorites of mine who drew inspiration from Lear are the late Edward Gorey and the contemporary artist Barry Moser. But to talk about them all would require another lecture. In the field of natural history painting, there are several notable artists who are today carrying on the Lear legacy. These include the British artist Elizabeth Butterworth, who has created her own spectacular monographs on parrots that Lear would certainly have admired, and the late Australian artist William Cooper, who's famous for his large format illustrations of birds. His scientific monographs on parrots, toucans, kingfishers, and most recently on pigeons, carry the Lyrian, Gouldian traditions into the 21st century. The American painter Walton Ford has taken this tradition and moved it into the realm of fine art, providing his own considerably darker perspective by creating works of art that contain complex subtexts about human excess and environmental degradation. Here, the superficial beauty of the birds seduce us into admiring a scene that, on closer inspection, is filled with details that portend their ultimate destruction. Ford's paintings often reveal a rapacious abuse of the natural world and make subtle and sometimes not so subtle references to human savagery and decadence. Sex, violence, cruelty, and man-made environmental disasters are sub-themes that run through almost every one of Ford's large, beautifully rendered watercolors. <laughs> 
Another contemporary American painter, James Prosek, plays with the more gentle and whimsical side of Lear's imagination. At left is his painting of an imaginary species he calls a cockatool. And although not obvious at first, a careful look at Prosek's picture reveals a variety of Swiss army, -like, army knife-like tools emerging from the primary feathers in the bird's wings. And here's an earlier variation on the same theme where tools appear in the feathered crest. One would well imagine Lear himself creating a drawing like this in one of his pun-filled letters. In fact, here is one of Lear's whimsical botanicals next to James Prosek's imaginary bird. And here is a comparison with one of Lear's more strictly scientific plates. Although Prosek's paintings are not directly derived from Lear, the parallels are striking. Like Lear, Prosek loves to play with puns as he explores the meaning of taxonomic classification, as we see in this painting of an imaginary hybrid parrotfish. One can only imagine how pleased Edward Lear would be to see artists like James Prosek and Walton Ford giving new interpretations to some of the very same subjects that he so enjoyed during the early decades of his life. Lear's extraordinary paintings and those of others who continued to probe the boundaries between science, art, and imagination enrich our lives and make the world a more interesting place. This is the kind of continuing legacy which I'm sure Lear would have enjoyed and encouraged. Who knows what kinds of paintings he himself might be creating were he alive today. Well, there is so much more to say about Edward Lear, but our time is limited. So I will close now by thanking Houghton Library for giving me access to such wonderful paintings over many years. Uh, and the Museum of Comparative Zoology for inviting me to speak about him this evening. Thank you also for all the support that you give to those two wonderful institutions, to the university as a whole, and to many other institutions around Cambridge and Boston. And thanks for coming tonight. <laughs>